And uh, yeah, I would like to welcome to the stage to Lucia Rakocevic. She is um, the legal and regulatory lead uh, from the Secretariat. So everyone who has been working on legal and regulatory issues uh, might have been in touch with her already. She's also deeply involved with the, with the technical assistance, in fact. that work this time. Um, okay, now we're zooming out a bit because we've been discussing the, let's say, examples of the islands and the local projects, but we're gonna zoom out a bit and discuss what the local, regional, but also national governments can do to support islands in energy transition. Uh, we have a regulatory session, a panel of two people, and then another intervention from uh, our project officer at DITA, and I would like to welcome to stage Gustav Blomberg from Allen Islands in Finland. We're going to have Georgios Aliaga online, I hope he's there, from Ministry for Environment and Energy of Greece. And we're also going to have Edita Dransekaite, our project officer for the Clean Energy for You Island Secretariat. Welcome. Um, to start off, you can sit here, maybe, yeah? To start off, I will have a few slides on what we have been doing as the Secretariat uh, for the regulatory analysis and barriers to understand what is it first on the national level that is needed to support and foster energy transition on the islands. Um, in the past year or so, year, more than a year, the Secretariat has been working with the stakeholders from the local level, regional level, and the national level to understand current state of legislation and regulation that supports renewable energy, energy efficiency, and energy community projects, and also to understand which are the current, let's say, gaps and what is stopping this uh, transition, stopping, what is, uh, let's say, um, slowing down the transition. Uh, in this effort, we have focused on seven countries. Um, maybe I can change there. Yeah. Um, well, you've seen the panel, and uh, two people will be here in person, and uh, Georgius is online, as I mentioned. Uh, we've been, in, in the last year, focusing with the seven countries. First, we looked at all the 15 countries that have inhabited islands, and we look at the support mechanisms that are there 
on the national level and that is available now from the website of the Secretariat as the regulatory inventory. Uh, you can access it, it's publicly available. And then we looked into the seven countries in more details. Uh, these seven countries are Greece, Italy, Croatia, Spain, uh, Estonia, Ireland and Sweden. And we've been working there with the national stakeholders to understand uh, where, what is happening right now, where some, let's say, emerging regulations or legislation, and how can we help, maybe with examples from other countries, uh, with some analysis of the regulation, with some support to um, help them and also include the regional and the local stakeholders in the transitioning of the islands. Uh, this, this work has and it's leading towards the studies that will be on the national level. Uh, the studies will be available by November for all of the countries, but we're slowly working with the different countries at the different times and some of you are involved in this work, so you're aware. The idea of the studies is that we analyze and we identify uh, which are the priority barriers, regulatory and legislative barriers. Then we identify, let's say, some of the best practices as well, but also we provide some recommendations on how to overcome those barriers. The recommendations are not, uh, in any sense, mandatory ones. The, the study is accepted, but it's something that we're developing together with the stakeholders and that we're hoping, as it is in line with what is already happening in those countries, that it will provide a direction to uh, for the national stakeholders, but also for the regional and local stakeholders to know where this should go and how they can help, let's say, bring the regulation and legislation forward. As I mentioned multiple times that we've been involving different stakeholders, we have been doing this through these focus groups and we met with the, with the stakeholders. They've seen the, the current drafts of the study. We've discussed with them also in the bilateral meetings. Um, and then we're also organizing national stakeholder meetings per country where we'll be discussing the, the details and the, let's say, three most priority barriers for that country. But what I wanted to do here today is not necessarily focus on any of the countries, but sort of um, look at an overview of what we have learned looking at all of these countries and what we have seen as some, let's say, horizontal barriers. And I show it here as a a barrier cloud, <laughs> if you can say that. And the ones that you see bigger are the ones that we see in more countries and that are more important. And then the ones that are smaller are the ones that are showing up, but they're not in all the countries. Of course, for example, as you can see, one of the main ones is lack of coordination of energy transition on the islands. And that's meant from sort of, let's say, from the national level, um, but also including the people from the local level. As you can see, uh, lack of attention to local level that's meant more in the strategic documents and in the strategic documents, not just mentioning that island transition should happen, but also paying attention to the characteristics of the islands and how what is planned on the national level for energy transition and for the goals um, can be reflected on the local level. Some of the things that we'll be discussing today and that I would like to focus on today is there, let's say, more specific um, barriers and that's a lengthy and complex permitting procedure, which we see in most of the countries as the barrier. Of course, as I say, these are uh, most important when you look at all the countries together. For the different country, one will be more important than another and the priority might be different, but they, sh they show up uh, persistently in all the countries. So the lengthy and complex permitting procedure is something that we'll tackle during the discussion today, uh, but it's for the renewables, but also for energy communities. If energy communities want to apply for clean energy projects, it's very complex for them to do this. And in uh, rare cases, we see simplifications for energy communities. Then we go to uh, the second one that I wanted to focus on is the spatial planning, which we also heard about this morning, and sort of how we implement energy transition, but take care of the other priorities that the islands have, not just from the envir environmental point of view, but also tourism, agriculture, uh, industry. There is a limited land on the islands, and this, um, let's say, in the planning documents, not we, we see energy planning documents on the local level somewhere. We also see spatial plans exist, 
but how these are integrated and which are the documents, the planning documents that will tell us what is the priority for the use of the resources on the islands. Uh, this, is, this is currently in the process, so it needs a bit of a, of a push, let's say. And then the final one that we'll be uh, focusing on today, as you see, there is also other ones, but the final one is related to security of supply and how do we make sure in the energy transitioning that we assure security of supply um, by, we see here the congestions and the grid lines, we see stringent requirements for connection of the renewables on the islands, um, but we also see lack of regulation and legislation for batteries and storage, uh, standalone storage, for demand side management. Um, so these are some of the things that we put together in the, this, let's say, group of security of supply. And um, maybe some of the recommendations, but I just show them to sort of, um, let's say, just as a group of ideas as they show up in the current drafts of the studies. Um, some of the, as you can see also, one of the important ones that we find, that we find in, in discussion with the stakeholders, they also find to be interesting as an option is this task force for islands on the national level that would bring together people from the national level, but also from the regional and local level people that have implemented projects uh, for clean energy and that know which are the struggles in the permitting procedure, which are the struggles in working with people uh, on the local level and how can procedures be different so that they can work together um, with the national stakeholders to improve the legislation and the authorization procedures. There is also other ones which I, I won't go through in details. We, we will hear some also later on from uh, what is currently being adopted on the, on the European level. Um, what we heard also yesterday is for permitting and authorization procedures. What we heard from the commissioner is these one-stop shops. We also heard about the master plans for uh, renewable energy projects that can help expedite uh, these projects in certain areas. We see in certain countries, such as uh, Portugal and Spain, that there is simplification of procedures for renewable energy projects, even up to 150 megawatts. Uh, so it's, it's an ongoing process, and I think it's definitely something that with the current energy situation, which was mentioned earlier, and current also political situation, it's something that cannot be, um, let's say, we cannot undermine this, we cannot ignore this, we have to address the current situation and say, okay, can we use the current situation to somehow push for energy transition on the islands as well? So with this, I will um, stop my, uh, my discussion, but you'll hear more from us um, regarding the studies, and the studies will be public, as I mentioned, by November. Uh, it will come out for different countries at different times as we're, as the, we're working in the different dynamics. Um, and then we'll, you'll hear more from us about what are some of the conclusions and what can be done based on that. But now I would like to give floor to my panel, uh, Gustav, and also Georgios, I think he should be online. Do we have Georgios online? Hello, hello, yes. Yes, hi. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we will, if that's okay for you, I'll give floor to Gustav first. Um, he can introduce himself and uh, let us know a bit about the Allen Islands, and then we'll give the floor to you. Thank you. Yes, it's my pleasure. Here you go. Yes. Um, well, m my name is Gustav Blomberg, and uh, I work for the infrastructure department at the government of the Allen Islands. Um, I will have a brief uh, presentation um, about the. Uh, uh, autonomy of the Olan Islands and um, how it can work uh, or ha how autonomy can work um, as a tool for energy transition. Um, so, um, the Olan Islands um, is uh, inhabited by 30,000 people, is part of Finland and uh, also part of the EU. 
but uh, enjoy special cultural and institutional rights and also extensive legislative uh, autonomy. Oland has its own government and parliament which enact laws under their competencies. Um, Oland has legislative competencies over matters such as energy, spatial planning and construction, climate and environment, electricity and electricity grid. Uh, we have, for example, our own TSO and also local road and train and ferry traffic. So, and Oland has used its legislative competences to speed up the transition from using oil and fossil fuel based energy to using renewable energy resources. So, um, examples of how decentralization and autonomy have helped Oland with regard to the energy transition. Uh, well, the Oland Islands has been able to, to focus on its number one strategic resource, which is wind. Uh, Oland produces today about 65% of the total electricity usage on the islands from wind power farms, um, and some days even producing more electricity than consumed, so we export it to Sweden. Uh, and Oland has been able to use its competencies uh, to legislate new economic support packages to wind farm operators and both small and big scale farms. Um, so the Oland legislative competencies and the ability to plan its own public waters and also its proximity to the high, le high electricity consumption areas on mainland Finland and Sweden and the vast opportunity connected to offshore wind farms have put Oland on the front foot in generating interest from interna international offshore wind farm companies and also to become a Nordic center for offshore wind power production. So, uh, which we can see here that, that, uh, that the autonomy and the legislative competencies uh, not only is, is um, is a tool for us, but it's also uh, um, a tool for, for international companies because they can see that, that if, the Oland has, uh, if Oland has legislative competences in these areas, uh, companies become interested because they don't need to speak directly with the central government, which can be bureaucratic or very, how to say, non-flexible. Um, and Oland has, if you come to also other examples, uh, Oland has, uh, with relative ease, uh, legally and financially supported the transition of the local traffic towards electrification and from fossil fuel energy-based heating systems in buildings to more viable solutions based on heating pumps and, it, and electricity as the main power source. And this also combined with uh, support for solar panels on buildings. So, a couple of recommendations. Um, bureaucratic and centralized governance structures and uh, administrative processes most often do not make life easier for small islands wanting to go ahead and start to develop its own strategic renewable energy transition. This can be problems with uh, centralized permitting or and construction processes for renewable energy products. So therefore, my recommendation is uh, that islands should seek to gain political support from the national government or from the regional government to gain more competence in the fields of renewable energy products and special, special planning. So yes, that was my brief presentation. Thank you, Gustav. Um, we'll also have a short um, presentation from Georgios, and then we'll have time for the discussion. Um, Georgios, if you're here, uh, do you want to share the slides? Yes? All right. Um, you have about five minutes for a presentation, if that's okay. Okay. So, good morning to everyone. It's also, my name is Jorge Leagas, and I'm an advisor to the Secretary General of the Energy and Mineral Resources. It's uh, my pleasure to participate in this forum, and uh, unfortunately, virtually, even virtually, but uh, there was not a better place, I think, 
have the road of Ireland, the beautiful road of Ireland, that plays a leading role in the green transition, while giving the chance to visit the first Greco island, at the, Halki, the island of Halki, which exemplifies the governance vision and the Greco island initiative. This initiative is very much relevant to the primary initiative of the government and our clean energy policies. And undoubtedly, the EU for Islands initiative and the Greco Islands initiative and all these initiatives will not take place if we don't have, if we don't create a friendly and attractive investment environment. So before, before, before presenting the process that we have done, allow me to give you a glimpse of the roadmap of this transition. So Greece, as you know, has set ambitious targets and uh, is one of the most ambitious uh, national energy climate plan in the euro. We are already rewriting the policies and measures to meet the updated EU targets for 55% and to become pioneer on climate change. We continue working towards the phasing out of lignite parks and we take measures to increase RS participation in the energy mix and we have a huge program on energy savings. Specifically, if we see in renewables, by 2030, our target is 80.7 gigawatt. Specifically, PV is 7.7 .7 and uh, wind 7 gigawatt by 2030. And taking into account the installed capacity, that which is estimated approximately 12 gigawatt, we need to add new capacity of around 7, 8 gigawatt, uh, with, which will be covered mainly by PV and wind. Of course, but clear that in order to meet these goals, we need investments. We need more rest in the upcoming years, and in combination with the deployment of storage system, will give a special boost to the renewable sector. How are we going to ensure that? First of all, with new policies and the comprehensive regulatory and legislative framework, we have already completed the first phase of simplification with the replacement of production license with a registration certificate and the, and the reformation of uh, environmental uh, term, terms approval. And uh, abolishing administrative, administrative burdens at cost for the investors, but also setting milestones for the maturity of the project. Now we are working on the second phase of simplification with intervention in connection terms and agreements, installation and operation of license. We have the same mentality for further simplification and we proceed to a new legislative package that will drive to speed up renewable projects in the coming years. If we want to go more specifically, we move forward to three pillars, simplification of procedures. We can see standard forms, the avoidance of examination and evaluation of the same documents by different bodies, a simple folder update in most changes of the project design, Regarding the digitalization, the main uh, change is the establishment of a, a one-stop shop that will be managed by ministry and uh, the adoption of an information system that will interact with all the individual information, the other infor information systems and acceleration of the, pro of the procedures with the reduction of the administrative burden and setting an obligation to the investors to develop quick uh, the, their projects. That's how we ensure a more friendly and accessible environment. But apart from uh, easy, an easy environment, we want to have create a safe environment for the investors. So we continue to believe that a tender and the support scheme for renewables is the most efficient way. We will expand we expanded 
the scheme until the end of 2025. As you can see, the previous tenders in the diagram will have a reduction of prices that consequently means energy decrease, dec reduction of energy costs for, fi for final consumers. So this auction scheme was very successful and will expand it until the, for uh, the next four years. So the new joint auctions will have a technology quota of 30% at different selling prices per technology, Georgia. recognizing the difficulties, yeah? Uh, okay, I have to yeah. I have to interrupt you. I'm sorry. I would like to focus on the on the permitting procedure, which you already covered. So, if that's okay for you, of course, the slides will be available for participants later on. Um, could we yeah, maybe? Two more slides. Yes, I know, but we we're very limited with time. So, if that's okay. okay for you, if you can stop sharing, I would like to go through the discussion. But indeed. Uh, the slides will be available, uh, both Gustav's and yours, to the participants later on, so they can check it out and uh, contact you if they have any questions. I would like to start the discussion uh, with, with one question for each of you, and then if somebody else has questions, we can uh, move on to that. Uh, first, thank you for the presentation. I think there is a lot of uh, things that the government is planning to do on simplification of procedures. Uh, my, question, my first question to you is, we know that currently there is a, a bit of a simplified procedure for the connection to the grid for the plants that are below one megawatt um, in Greece. Um, what is your experience with this simplified procedure and what, how do you see this implementation of all these activities for simplification ongoing in the coming years? Yeah, uh, yes, that's the simplification of many years before. And uh, generally speaking, we should, we should, we must be very cautious when we intervene with uh, simplify, simplifying the procedure. That means that we sh should not give the wrong sign to the market, or the market should not translate uh, with uh, the simplification as a speed race or a chance to create uh, the, to have more profits. So, it, so in the end, we, we, with through the simplification, we, probably sometimes we have the, the totally different results, the opposite results of uh, the of the acceleration of the project. Has this so, happened already? The, I mean, is this something that that you experienced yeah, already? And this uh, is uh, exactly we had some uh, this kind of uh, problems and uh, projects. Not only for uh, small PVs, but uh, and uh, we face that in the first uh, in the first step of uh, of simplification. But there are pros and cons always, and uh, I totally believe that the simplification the simplification of the process is in the right way. So, specifically for the small projects, uh, we have the positive thing that. We give the chance to small investors, to farmers, to households, to come in touch with renewables and to have an extra income. But from the opposite side, we have we had thousands of applications to the, to Hesno, which is the, the distributor, and uh, we had the long delays to correspond to this uh, request. And finally, we had the congestion of the system. So, on the one hand, okay, the measures and policies we should, we should require, they are required to facilitate the investors, but we should combine with filters, mechanisms, and probably guarantees, so as to have the real investors and to, to tr try to accelerate the projects and not to create more problems uh, to that. Thank you, Georgie. And uh, Gustav, we heard from you about the Allen Islands. Um, we know that 10 years ago, the Allen Islands were uh, importing about 70% of the energy that they're using. And now you say that you, you're covering 65% of the energy that you need and sometimes you export. Um, what do you see as the main, uh, let's say, role of the local or regional government and how they can help? Because we have representatives here from the other islands. 
uh, how they can help to, to push the energy transition on their island with the regulation? Mostly, I think it's uh, financial and um, expert support. Uh, so the, the regional government and and uh, um, and um, the, the authorities can can especially give give uh, legal support, but also the the legislative frame for for giving um, financial support and grants to 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 um, rest projects. Um, so that is one thing. Um, then I think also another important aspect is to is for regional governments to to actually um, be part of projects um, to um, being in being co um, in very close contact with uh, local municipalities and islands and um, also to make sure that that um, the legislative frameworks are um, focused also on small uh, islands and um, small territories that they are flexible um, not that strict and um, yeah I think that's that's important aspects and and as I also mentioned in my presentation that the decentralization is very important throughout the whole system for example, that that the, the, the national authorities should make sure that that the, the, the permitting processes are, are decentralized down to regional governments, or perhaps even down to municipalities. So, you more, the more local the permitting processes are, the more faster they are, I think, and more flexible. Um, we have few um, few minutes or ten minutes, five ten minutes. If you have any questions um, to our panelists, please feel free to ask. Uh, Christina is there with the microphone. Just raise your hand. We hear sort of two different. Um, Jan, go ahead. We hear two different perspectives: one from the local and regional level, but one also from the national level. And it's different how there is a differences in uh, what they prioritize. I'm going to stand here because otherwise I, I block the camera. Um, well, my question is, I mean, we've been hearing about simplification of procedures for 20 years, and no one is against it. So um, the question is not um, whether you need to agree on it. The question is, how are you going to do it? And, and I've worked in government, and I've seen that changing the procedures is sometimes taking as much time as the procedures themselves. So if we now want to accelerate the energy transition uh, and the Repower EU package, uh, we'll pr propose some, some elements for that. You know, how will this really be sped up? Because you know, the, 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 uh, the acceleration of the, of the uh, planning procedures is something that has been announced but has not been done. And the same thing with the one-stop shop. Everyone is for it, of course, who would be against it, but how will you make sure it's not just another shop next to the other ones? Uh, how will the, sh the, the ten other shops be closed and the one-stop shop be the only one where people go to? Georges, um, you want to answer that? And then we'll have a comment from Gustav. Yeah. Uh, yes, regarding the simplification process, where we are, we are trying to complete it, and uh, we know that uh, the whole license procedure now lasts more than seven, eight years. And uh, from the first day, from from the first day in this position in the, this government, trying to to find the problems and the bottlenecks in the license procedure, to cut down it in three in uh, less than two years. So. Through this, uh, through small changes, but also trying to be more flexible for the for the maturity to much, for the developers to mature the projects. Uh, so not all the investors in uh, in every change of the project uh, to have to go step back and then to modify all the licensing proceed all the licenses and then to, to develop again the project from the, from the first uh, license. So 
all these type of procedures and uh, we believe that uh, will accelerate that uh, will have more uh, more quickly the installation of fresh projects uh, in the next uh, years regarding the one stop shop uh, regarding the one stop shop we have we we'll create an informa information system here in the ministry that will uh, inc will include all the informative systems uh, below. So we're we'll trying to to connect all the all the services, all the bodies, uh, the inf and the and the systems of each one, and uh, having a having a better image. And uh, between the steps, we will be able to follow the licensing uh, identity, if I can say, it, of, uh, of the project. And uh, all the documents will move from uh, the one body to the other body digitally without uh, uh, the need uh, to submit uh, files, documents, uh, copies, and uh, have a thousand uh, applications and requests on everybody, on every service or uh, every authority. If I understood correctly, Georgius, this is something that's already in accepted, but not yet. A, it's a, it's already accepted as the text, but not yet adopted, right? Uh, the first phase, it's uh, it has all, it has been already legislated uh, from 2020. Yeah. The second phase of legislation. Uh, the public consultation was completed before uh, 10 days, 10th of May. It was until 10th of May. It will be legislated in the next month, I think in June, and it will be implemented uh, from the first day. So from the day one, we will have a new legislative package, a new framework that decreases the documents, decreases the time, responded from authorities and accelerate the licensing, the permitting process of the investors. Okay, well, thanks, uh, thanks, Georgius. Well, good luck. We'll see how, how it goes with implementation. Gustav, did you want to comment on that? Um, well, um, um, uh, one way to, to actually simplify and make processes um, faster is actually to 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 legislate minimal uh, processing days for the government. So, for example, um, I know that uh, some uh, uh, regions uh, have, for example, uh, three months, like um, maximum uh, processing days for for uh, many type of of um, uh, uh, processes and, and applications. Um, so that is one way to do it. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think also a very important thing is, is uh, actually to, to let the municipalities and the local islands um, has, uh, have more power to, to actually uh, do the projects and to, to, to be operational. Thank you, Gustav. Um, so, oh, uh, one more question. Uh, go ahead. And then we're... Hello. I am from the energy community of Sifnos. We were very encouraged by the words of the Greek Prime Minister last November in Halki, and the minister, Mr. Skrekas, as regards energy communities. The prime minister encouraged all Greek islands to create energy communities in cooperation with their local authorities and apply to the government for support to have local uh, energy projects. That was a very positive signal for us at the very high political level. But however, at, the, at more lower levels, there are problems at the legislative process. Three problems which I would like to underline to Mr. Aliagas. One is the question of bank guarantees required 
to the energy communities. Big bank guarantees, the energy communities are, are poor, they don't have the money to produce such bank guarantees. They are serious organizations, they have many members, they have the local authorities, but the bank guarantees were requested because I understand the government wanted to discourage uh, not real interested investors, but you know, uh, uh, less serious people from, from applying. But that's not the case for an energy community. So bank guarantees is a serious problem. Second problem is the deadlines. As soon as an energy community submits a project, this has to be, and gets an, an, an approval, a permit, it has to be completed in two or three years. This could be possible if an investor could start immediately. This is not possible because the investor currently does not have a price to invest. We are waiting for prices to be set. It, according to the Greek law, this is now the competence of the minister. So uh, without having a price, the investor doesn't know if the project is, uh, is, is, is viable. So uh, three things, uh, bank guarantees, deadlines, and price are three issues which have to be settled so that the energy communities in Greece can proceed with their projects. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, Georges, did you want to comment anything on the procedures for the energy communities? Of course. We, we, like, we like energy communities. We want to see to all islands and also the mainland have more good energy communities. Because as we know with the, with the existing uh, with existing legislation and uh, that that launched in 28 2018 and uh, we had we had the, the negative aspect we see some negative uh, examples of energy communities and we want to proceed with more with more communities and more good communities so our, our intent to our intention is to to have a new law a reformation of the scheme for the energy communities to attract more the participation of citizens to this to these communities and these communities were trying to have a funding so as to so as to cover the financial not feasibility uh, of the communities to for bank guarantees we know the problem that uh, the energy communities uh, are facing now. And uh, either from RRF, that is the Recovery and Resilience Fund, that will have 100 million euros for the, for the energy communities that participate uh, the, the mayor, the, the, the city, or uh, for uh, for net metering and energy and uh, the covering the energy consumption, but also through other programs, we are trying to have more funds so for uh, to cover uh, these needs. Regarding the deadlines, the the deadlines and the price, uh, there is a price now for uh, energy communities, so. I don't know why, uh, why, why the, the, for this co uh, the reason for this comment. At the deadlines, uh, we think uh, that uh, also for uh, the energy communities, with the new, in the new scheme, will have will be more flexible and will try to have a, a fulfilled scheme for uh, energy communities to develop uh, their projects. But a last comment, the, as you know, with the, with the new REST directive, uh, the scope and the target of energy communities, it's not to produce and have profits of this uh, activity, but it's more for social and environmental uh, 
uh, impact. So these communities we want to, and we're, we're trying to have more attractive uh, motivations, let's say, for uh, this uh, scope. Thank you, Georgius, and thank you, Gustav. And actually, with that uh, comment, Georgius, you sort of give me uh, a lead to say that in the afternoon, we'll also have a session discussing energy communities, and we'll also have a lot of uh, different six uh, representatives from energy communities participating, so we'll have a chance to discuss this as well. And I'm sorry if you have more questions, but we have to slowly wrap up. And uh, another thing that Georgius mentions, that is the the EU regulations and the directives, and we have a chance here to hear from Edita Dransekaite, uh, who is our policy officer for the Secretariat, and uh, she'll uh, briefly close and present to us what is coming up in the EU legislation and how is this relevant for the discussion that we've had. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry, I will still try to use not more than five minutes, but I thought, since we already mentioned that today is this D-Day for uh, European energy policy, and uh, in basically a couple of hours, the big, big uh, uh, announcements on the toolbox, and we call it toolbox for the Repower EU, will come out and will be commented and read by anyone, but I thought we have this opportunity to have a little sneak in what's coming in one of the pillars, because actually this pillar very, very well mirrors the discussion we had this morning today. Uh, it's a permitting package. And the package will include a very targeted legislative proposals for modification of renewable energy directive provisions on the permitting. Uh, it also will include, I would guess, even more interesting documents which are accompanying the legislative proposals. And those documents are recommendations, very practical recommendations, uh, on the steps and actions which member states and stakeholders can take already now to speed up the permitting procedures and to make sure that we can get more renewables and faster across the EU. And the other document will be very practical guidance, really explaining most of those proposals and here, you know, when I was seeing your word cloud, and actually I could say that the building blocks of the package mirror exactly the main keywords you had there. And I hope that it's a good sign that we all already agree on the problems that exist. But what I could see from this early morning reading through the documents for myself and for you, that actually there are lots of very, very practical examples which member states are already implementing in those various elements and areas and bottlenecks to inspire, to show to you that there are simple or more complex, but still there are things possible to do. So, and the other, of course, element is the really list of practical uh, very short term or longer term recommendations. So I'm just kind of giving you a little overview of what comes in in the block terms. So first and of course very important one is faster and shorter administrative and authorization procedures. And here the package speaks about maximum duration of the procedures and very, very clearly a very kind of explicit time frames for different uh, parts of the procedures. Then there is flexibility of technology specifications so that to make sure that when you get the permit your technologies you want to apply are not already obsolete and then you need to go for new permit. Uh, it's also about single permit procedures so this so-called one-stop shops but really speaking about that permits can be applied or received via the single procedure and not one after another. Of course it speaks about also limiting of abusive litigation procedures and of course also very important part and for many of you is uh, reducing to minimum necessary the procedures for prosumers and energy communities and small scale mm, installations. The other very, very important element or, or building block of the package is, uh, and I think yesterday we spoke a lot in different mm, formal and informal discussions, is sufficient capacity of the human resources and scaling of permits issuing authorities. And here it's about the enough of people there, but also that people have necessary training and skills to issue permits. Uh, so you will see it's lots of things there, but I would say on the examples, but also it describes very well different tools which exist in the national and European level to help authorities to reach those skills. And 
just I will advertise one thing. It will be in the next technical support instrument called the flagship will be exactly the dedicated support for member states on accelerating permitting for renewable energy. So keep an eye and really use and abuse it as you can. Uh, the other one, of course, is better identification and planning of locations for renewable energy. And this is the big one, which includes many, many elements, starting from this interesting concept, which already was announced, but now it's really described in legal terms and also in uh, recommendations and guidance. It's so-called renewables go to areas, areas. So basically the areas which member states have to designate, uh, which are particularly suitable for installation of plants, uh, for production of uh, energy from new renewable sources. And this becomes an obligation, but also it describes, you know, how and where and when it can be done. Uh, it also talks about very supportive spatial planning procedures. And the key word you have there is about necessary cooperation among different levels of governments, especially necessary for the federal states or for the countries with autonomous regions and, of course, for the countries with the islands. Uh, also, I saw very interesting examples with the use of uh, digital tools. So please look there. It's kind of quite an easy existing solutions to make sure, I mean, ab about the open data and about the existence of digital tools, which can also help to facilitate to select the locations. Uh, community acceptance and involvement, of course, is a big topic in there. And it's about the basic things, about early involvement of communities in the spatial planning, but also about the variety of measures both in organizational terms but also in financial terms, how you basically make sure that communities benefit from the installations which are in the vicinity of their living spaces. But, you know, and there are lots of models starting from energy communities and other collective uh, energy production and consumption schemes, but also from different financial incentives and what member states are doing or can do. And of course, the big one is environment. So here I will not go into big detail, you read it, but here we have overriding public interest. And this means that you know, all the renewable energy projects need to be seen uh, via this lens of the fastest and the easiest procedures, permitting procedures available in the member states and benefit from that. And the final one, which is of course not the least one, but it's a better inter interconnection to the grid. And here we really see a very big importance to have this access to the grid and not limiting the renewable resources deployment. And if I have to choose only one from this, it would be about transparency. It's a very, very good paragra paragraph, not paragraph, the, the chapter on the need to ensure transparency on grid capacities on, on the best places to connect the renewable energy, which should be made publicly available online to all the stakeholders and that everyone could see where they could go to, for easier permits. So I think I stop it there. Mm -hmm. I gave you a bit of sneak, but I think, you know, it could be already interesting to see this as something to come coming and, you know, please read, share with whoever would be interested and, you know, let's try to see with small steps how we can proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Dita, and I think you give us. You gave us an important homework also to read all this as it comes out and understand how it can be implemented in different countries and also to benefit the islands. I would like to take, thank everybody in our panel, Gustav and Georgios as well. territories of France, uh, the Netherlands, and Denmark, and they're situated in the Caribbean, the Pacific, the North Atlantic, and uh, uh, the South Indian Ocean. So really all over the globe and in different kinds, they, they, they reach from the tropics to the poles. The North
kinds of yeah, climates and with all kinds of challenges. Is it still working? Yep. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, okay. okay. Keep it close. Uh, sorry. Okay. Closer to your mouth, yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. Uh, so, uh, about us, the overseas countries and territories have been a part of the European family since uh, 57, since the very Treaty of Rome. And we at OCTA, we serve as a platform where they come together and they discuss and they uh, coordinate policies and do things together. Uh, and we are registered in uh, Belgium and our headquarters in, in Brussels. Uh, now, renewable energy is uh, a core part of what we, uh, of, of our work with the European Commission and the, the, the work we do together and the support we receive both ways. And this was reaffirmed uh, last year when the new uh, decision on the overseas association was signed, which is our main uh, document on, with the EU. Now, in terms of uh, transition strategies, what, what I'm going to pre present is less uh, one strategy and more of a process, a strategic process that we have gone through. And it starts, well, it starts a long time ago, but more recently it starts uh, in 2015 when the governments of the OCTs came together and uh, decided to make uh, sustainable energy transition a uh, priority. And by that, they decided that look, we are a, a number of small islands all over the planet, some bigger, some smaller. Uh, there's a lot of benefit in working together, in sharing experiences, in pushing each other, in collaborating on this. And that is what they did, and this is, the, let's say, the basis of the modern transition that we're going to, through. And yeah, the areas of cooperation included technical, economic, legal, there, there, there were a full list of domains uh, very specific of cooperation. Now, based on that, in 2016, uh, a quick scan was uh, done on the IRENA Seeds Lighthouse Initiative Framework. So this was a scan to see for each of the OCTs, which back then includes the UK one, uh, where they are on renewable energy, what the status quo is, what the potential is, what the legal framework is, what the problems are. Then the reform started, the, the investment started, and uh, in 2020, we redid the scan. We used the same methodology. Uh, to ensure that the results are comparable. And we want to see what has happened in the four years. And we were quite happy to see that there was al almost a doubling of overall renewable energy in the um, uh, OCTs. And uh, there was an uh, increase not only in the quantity, but in the quality in the sense that the legal frameworks had improved, the resources, the, the whole structure had improved. And now, uh, Later this year, in uh, quarter four, we aim to update again to see what happened in the last two years, despite COVID and all the setbacks that come with it. Uh, in the meantime, we published last year a uh, Blue Economy Roadmap. This is a huge strategy document uh, on a bunch of uh, priorities and areas, uh, maritime, uh, tourism, uh, agriculture, but it also focuses on energy. And we took the opportunity to come up with recommendations for OCTs in general and for each one in particular on how they can improve the pace at which the transition is happening. Uh, and th th this is in a very, it depends from one OCT to another, but in general it covers things like uh, planning, like uh, cooperation, like uh, cross-frontier projects, uh, like locally made hydrogen, and a lot of the things that we've been discussing today and uh, yesterday. Now, to go into examples, the general trend in the OCTs is that uh, renewable energy is becoming more and it's been a priority, but now it's becoming more and more priority number one. Uh, and that goes hand in hand with SDG 7 on ensure access to affordable energy uh, with the uh, aims and of ambitions that they had already set themselves, but it's, uh, it's becoming the main thing they need to do. And I picked two examples of uh, recent strategies. One is Curaçao, uh, which published its, its uh, national energy strategy, and it's available online. And the, the way it, it approaches the problem is to have, uh, of course, an overview of the main, uh, all, all the nice things we hear here, the mission, the aim, but then it goes into detailed uh, uh, missions and detailed things it wants to do, and then it goes into further details with KPIs, with years, with funding, 
uh, really to the lowest level. And, and this is something I think that has come up again and again that is something we need. And my last example uh, is Greenland. Now Greenland is in a completely different situation from Kurosawa. It's uh, in the Arctic region, it's cold, it's large, it's uh, the, the kind of uh, inhabitants are scattered. Uh, but it does have a lot of renewable energy. It has a, a huge hydro mix and uh, a hydro, uh, hydroelectric uh, mix. And I I its aims are more towards uh, green energy whenever possible, but also at uh, decent prices uh, to, to make it uh, somehow affordable for the people using it. And this is again something that makes renewable energy interesting for the people who maybe care, maybe have more immediate needs than the overall good of the planet. And here again, they, besides the strategy, in parallel, they started an analysis to see punctually what are the needs and what needs to be doing uh, to be done. So I won't go into details on that. We can have uh, discussions afterwards, or you can email me, and uh, we can discuss whenever. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I must admit I, I, I hadn't really thought about Greenland uh, when thinking about uh, OCTs, but indeed, you know, uh, and it's a, it's a very special situation, but perhaps also a very promising one. Is there a question um, on this presentation? No? Okay, uh, okay. Diana Polo, please go ahead. Um, I was... Yeah. I was wondering... <laughs> no, 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 it's working, it's working. Don't, don't put them together because then we'll have funny noises. Yeah. Push. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I was just wondering, you were talking about KPIs. I was wondering how you defined uh, KPIs. What was the process and what do you see as being the most important KPIs to follow in this uh, transition strategies? Yep. Thank you. So I, I don't have, uh, I wasn't involved in the drafting of the strategy, but the strategy has, like many of them do, huge tables where you have objectives, and each objective split into sub-objectives and so on and so on. Now, each one of them, uh, once they get to a concrete level, have a measurable, uh, you know, the generic uh, smart uh, framework of uh, defining KPIs. I wouldn't say one of them is more important than another. It depends from one of, I mean, if it depends on the objective if we're tra talking about limiting uh, w heating waste or, uh, renew uh, or um, wind power or solar power or installing or numbers. I, I think the fact of having uh, a structure where you can, in five years, check back and see, look, are we where we're supposed to be, where we set ourselves to be? I think that's the essential part of uh, what they're doing. Thanks, thanks for that. And I will perhaps add another question, um, because in some of the presentation, uh, we saw wave and tidal energy. And, you know, it's, the, it's a bit like nuclear fusion, you know, it's the, the eternal promise, it should work. but. We have done with the uh, uh, Clean Energy for EU Island Secretariat some pre-feasibility studies in our technical assistance uh, on uh, wave and tidal. And, you know, it, at the least thing you should say is it requires an enormous amount of public support still because the projects are not bankable. Um, it's, you know, in the rough seas, it's, it's a very complex environment. It's, it's, uh, you know, um, prototype technology at the moment. So what is your assessment? And I mean, not only for you, but the whole panel can react because I, I think also Ireland uh, mentioned uh, um, Tidal and, 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 and Wave. So how do we get through this? Will we be able to scale it up or will it remain, you know, some kind of interesting research topic? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah so. Hello? Yeah. Um, so for me, actually, the, the challenge, I don't think personally that anything that's going to sit um, at the bottom of the sea is going to surmount those challenges in the time that we need it. Um, because of the challenges of installation and implementation, but also operation and maintenance, 
do you know, if you need a team of people who are both qualified divers and qualified engineers, that Venn diagram of those skills is very, very limited. So we're never going to be able to deploy that skill set at scale as I see it. So I think that from my perspective, wave energy generators and uh, that sit above the, the water, you know, either by using oscillating columns or by having components that don't sit directly in the sea, um, and tidal generators that operate in, in similar fashions are the only ones that I can see working mm -hmm. in the future. I think that anything that, that really sits in the sea, especially in Ireland, where our seas are incredibly, incredibly rough, you know, our, you, you, in, here in the Mediterranean, you get two, two three meter waves, we get 18 meter waves. Do you know? So one, one big wave could break all of your generators if they're not robust enough. So. Very interesting. Uh, I don't know whether someone else wants to react to that. Okay. Yes. Uh, only uh, I uh, invite you to, to see BIMET in the north of Spain. That is a, a platform for uh, investigating uh, uh, tidal and, and waves. And uh, Plocan is in the, in the island is for uh, uh, wind offshore. But uh, I think this, these are the, the examples for uh, promote this mm -hmm. type of uh, technologies. What's the problem? The problem is the investment, but also the, uh, the commission. <laughs> because of the, the problem of the grants. The, you know that uh, GIVER limit the quantity of the, of the grant also and uh, the quantity of the investment mm -hmm. you can grant. So these pro this, uh, projects have a lot of uh, uh, investment now. How, how can we do it? With a, a, a public investment, yes, we can do it, but privates, where are the privates? we can uh, grant these projects. Yes. Well, thank you for that. It's uh, good to have this uh, insight from real projects and, and uh, uh, from the experiences uh, in, on the islands.